Hello, I'm Kevin Berger, author of Atheism is Untenable. There is no shortage of channels of religious individuals engaging in apologetics to defend their positions, and there is no shortage of channels of atheists using counter-apologetics to argue against them. But what about atheists' defense of their own positions? Who is holding them accountable? On this channel, I don't engage in apologetics. Instead, I apply the principles of polemics and skepticism to atheism and the claims made by atheists, of which, despite their existence to the contrary, there are many. This is justified nonetheless. I recently rewatched a couple of videos of Alex O'Connor, also known as Cosmic Skeptic, and there are a couple of points from these interviews that I think really exemplify my take on the idea of lack theism or non-theism, this idea of an absence or lack of belief. So I thought I'd post a video of my own showing those clips in my perspective. Let's take a look at those. I think so. I think that nihilism, as it were, carries with it the feeling of being naked. You sort of thrown off what were essentially optional clothes to reveal what was there all along, but when you actually face it to nature, it's embarrassing, it's scary, and you will do anything you can if you find yourself naked in public to find any clothes to put on, yeah. not just your old ones. It doesn't matter what clothes. Any clothes are better than no clothes. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is what people are beginning to realize. And so they're scrambling for their old clothes again. and Trying to legitimate. and Yes, and, and, and trying, to, trying to put them on. Um, and that's why it's easy as well for people to go around poking holes in other people's clothes. It's very easy to do. But uh, that, that's what the success of a movement like New Atheism consists in, in the fact that all they had to do was just tell other people why they're wrong. You only need to poke holes in other people's clothes. But if you need to like sew your own shirt, yeah. that gets a little more difficult. Yeah. C.S. Lewis said that the, that the purpose of philosophy is not the cutting down of forests, but the irrigation of deserts. Atheists aren't exceptions to this desire to not be naked. In the five plus years that I've been challenging atheists to provide empirical evidence to support their own claims, with rare exception, they've attempted to change the subject to anything else, most frequently to the claimed existence of a deity. This is despite the fact that I have explicitly and repeatedly stated that as someone who is irreligious and agnostic, I don't make that assertion. And even if I did, this would have no bearing whatsoever on the burden of proof for their claims. So it's a tactic that's both burden shifting and a red herring fallacy. It seems like while skeptics in general and atheists in particular are adept at poking holes in the clothes of the religious with regard to their beliefs, they're far less willing to apply their skepticism and critical thinking to themselves lest they find themselves bare. So they conflate epistemology with doxastics, agnosticism with episticism, knowledge and certainty with belief, suspension of judgment with suspension of belief, and so on. They've constructed for themselves this framework in which they can say, honestly, I don't know, and then pretend that this somehow equates to I lack belief. For the life of me, I'll never understand how and why anyone could ever think that I'm uncertain, I'm unconvinced, I'm undecided, I'm unsure, I don't know, could possibly be a middle ground between I believe P and I believe not P, when this is such an obvious category error. Yet this clearly fallacious argument is made constantly. Again, for the life of me, I'll never understand how and why anyone could ever think that just because I don't believe P doesn't mean I'm claiming not P is a valid argument when this is also such an obvious category error because as a claim is an action and belief is a doxastic position that needn't be accompanied by that action, it's clearly fallacious and yet it is also brought up constantly. I don't know, I'm uncertain, so on. These are all expressions of the epistemological position of agnosticism, which is not disputed and which can be falsified. It can be verified, it can be tested because as knowledge is justified true belief, we can see whether or not a proposition is justified. We can test whether or not something is true, that it actually conforms to reality. But the position does not preclude either belief in P or belief in not P. It doesn't even address the doxastic position at all. 
the point of contention is whether or not the doxastic position of not believing P is genuinely different from the doxastic position of believing not P. And that position can be held without knowing that P is true, without asserting to know that P is true, without being certain or convinced of it, without having any evidence for it, having good reason for it, being justified, being unwilling to change one's mind, wanting to believe it, or even being consciously aware of holding that belief. And despite that being in tension with one's explicit position, these are all bogus arguments that are brought up repeatedly. Regardless of what you believe or don't believe about free will, uh, the response, people's response to it is fascinating mm. to me. Absolutely fascinating. And <clears throat> maybe, yeah, maybe it is that degree of control, almost like the denial of death. Like, mm. I wonder, have they done experiments on when people are reminded that they do or do not have free will, that their behavior mm. adjusts? Not that I know of, but I would love to see that. Because if it is, I mean, maybe it is true, but I think if it is true, I, I can understand why it might be quite like fatalistic. I mean, it literally is quite fatalistic, really. Mm. To and it feels like there's something, it feels like there's some there there. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You you can't escape that illusion if it is an illusion. Wait, he said, is... like you know that I don't believe in free will. I don't know if you believe in free will. Perhaps we can talk about that. He he's like, look, you don't you, you don't believe in free will, but but you you act as if free will does exist all the time. And I remember thinking, what do you mean? What what, is it, what does it look like to act as though free will doesn't exist? Mm. The very argument or one of the arguments against free will is that you are essentially driven by your biology, your, your genes, your, your will, you know, the, the Arthur Schopenhauer line that you can do what you will, you just can't will what you will. In fact, you have to do what you will. That's, that's, what, that's what drives behavior. If that's the case, then, then why do you have this vision in your head that if you lack a belief in free will, you're just, like not going to get out of bed in the morning? The very argument is that you will get out of bed in the morning because you desire to go and get some breakfast. Mm. That's like the whole point. And so it, any argument of that form where people say, well, you don't live like that's the case. I always like to, to, to think, well, what would it look like to you then? Yeah. It seems to me that perhaps non-belief or an absence of belief as distinct from belief in the negation is an illusory subjective experience akin to free will that it's a manifestation of one's desire to control what they believe so as to avoid being or being perceived as gullible. I say this because it's possible that whereas the psychological construct of free will allows us to feel like we're in control of our actions, the psychological construct of non-belief allows one to feel like one is in control of one's beliefs. Yet, if the neural correlates that correspond to non-belief are indistinguishable from those of disbelief or belief in the negation, then per the principle of identity, it is in fact the same mental state regardless of any conceptual or linguistic distinction. All of the true beliefs that you hold, all of the beliefs that you have that you think are true, do you think that one of them, at least one of them, is in fact false? It has to have to be. Sure. Yeah. But if I asked you to go one by one through every belief you think is true, <laughs> you'd say, that's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. Because you think that they're true. And yet after telling me, this is true, this is true, this is true, and this is true, but at least one of them is false. Yeah. How, how does it, it, it's a, it, you know, it seems to be a paradox. Given the and involuntary it, and subconscious nature of belief, if one considers that it's possible that at least one belief that he or she believes is true is in fact untrue, then how can one be certain the alleged distinction between disbelief and non-belief is not such a proposition? Similarly, within said parameters, if one concedes that it's possible for at least one belief that she believes is justified is in fact unjustified, then how can one be certain that the alleged distinction between disbelief and non-belief is not such a proposition? Finally, taken in conjunction, and given that Beliefs cannot be subjected to direct empirical observation and testing, and subsequently cannot be falsified, verified, or known, then how can one be certain that the alleged distinction between disbelief and non-belief is not both unjustified and untrue? It seems like the best argument in favor of non-belief is essentially, I am the expert of my own mind. However, that's just a psychologist fallacy, and potentially an omniscience fallacy, coupled with an appeal to personal anecdote. 
which can easily be rebutted, if not outright refuted, by observation of behavior via action theory. Therefore, when an atheist asserts non-belief, while one is not justified in asserting you believe that no God exists, one is justified in believing that the atheist holds that belief should the atheist's actions correspond to people who hold that belief. In other words, no, this isn't an argument of I know your mind better than you. Rather, it's an argument of you may not know your mind as well as you think you do and making a valid inference based on action. Psychologists and mental health professionals make such inferences and have insights on the minds of others all the time. So there it is. The central argument of lack theism is that there is a genuine distinction between the absence of belief in a proposition and the presence of belief in its negation. The whole idea of atheism as just a lack of belief in deities is flawed for this very reason. One cannot logically get to not believing either a proposition or its negation without this asserted distinction. Yet, there is no empirical evidence of a distinct neurological state of not believing either of a pair of binary propositions, no empirical evidence of a difference in neural activity that constitutes not believing a proposition versus believing the negation, and no independently verifiable means by which to distinguish between not believing a proposition and believing its negation. All we have are the fallible self-reports of people's subjective experiences of their alleged absence of belief. Self-reports that, under any other circumstance, including, mind you, people's claims of their religious experiences with angels and deities, for example, would be rejected for numerous reasons. I see no compelling reason to make an exception in this case. So I ask, is it not possible that non-belief, as distinct from belief to the contrary, is just as illusory as free will? And how would we know either way given the nature of belief, that it's involuntary, that it can be subconscious, that it can be formed by a variety of factors that will lead to belief that isn't justified? If someone asserts the earth is flat, this is a falsifiable claim. We can gather evidence and thereby falsify that claim easily enough. We'd also verify whether or not the belief to that effect is justified. But what if the claim is, I believe that the earth is flat, or I believe the earth is not flat, or I don't believe the earth is flat, or I don't believe that the earth is flat? How does one falsify the neurological belief claim? Therein lies the problem. Given that aforementioned nature of belief, we cannot directly test or gather information on the belief claim. And I find it compelling that, that people still want to say that there is a distinction when there's no possible way to verify that. Now, sure, we can look at the actions. We can see because belief informs action, does this person's action correspond with an absence of belief? But the problem is because belief does inform action, any action that is suggested as evidence for the absence of belief in any deity would also serve as evidence for the presence of belief in the non-existence of deity. And again, because belief informs action, and an absence of belief provides no impetus for action, the presence of belief would be a better hypothesis. Until next time, remember, even if your beliefs aren't necessarily true, they may be justified nonetheless, and as an agnostic irreligious person, I do not assert that any deity exists. Stop trying to assign that burden of proof.